So welcome, Preston, for the talk here. All right, great. So thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate the invitation to come speak at this conference. I've had a great time listening to all of the other talks so far. Um, I feel some pressure now to finish with this last invited talk, but I think I am able to deliver. I have some exciting content here, so uh, certainly ready to jump in. And usually I like to start by uh, acknowledging some of the lab members right away. So this is some photos of the members of my group. Uh, without them, we couldn't have done really any of this work that I'm gonna present on. So I'm really grateful again for all of their work in the lab. Uh, and I also have here just the recap of the bio sketch that we just heard. So coming from my PhD with Evelyn Wang at MIT, then I had a couple years at Harvard for my postdoc, and then I've been at Rice for four years since the summer of 2019. And so my lab at Rice is interested in, in this intersection of energy, materials, and fluids. And it's a pretty big area of research, which we like. We can tap into a lot of interesting questions. But we do have some specific research thrusts that I'd like to take a moment to touch on, starting with some of the research thrusts that I won't talk about in much detail today. So one of those is engineered wettability. So we can design surfaces, of course, at the micro and nano scale. Uh, we can also look even at modifying them chemically to impart things like super hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity. Um, had some great conversations with folks already at this conference about this area of research. Hand in hand with this, actually, is contamination of surfaces. And so you're trying to design surfaces that have some tailored wettability, but now we have some contamination coming in from the ambient that's changing their behavior. Uh, and this is actually the source of a lot of confusion and debate in the literature. For example, the wettability of graphene, the wettability of rare earth oxides. The researchers have gone back and forth in the past decade, partly due to confusion about keeping samples clean before taking measurements. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out here that I think might be of interest to folks in the audience is that if you do want to keep your samples clean, just a couple of months ago, we came out with uh, an approach that was published here where we use a metal container. We increase the surface area at both the micro and nano scales to get a really high surface area. And then we make it really clean. And what this container does is the inner wall acts as a getter for contaminants. So if you put your sample in here, it will keep it clean. Uh, it's much better than a lot of the other stuff that's out there, vacuum and uh, different wafer holders and things. Um, and not only that, but we found that it works so well, you can even put a contaminated sample inside of here, let it sit for a week, and it will become clean because the container pulls the contaminants off the surface. So I just wanted to highlight this one. Happy to chat about it more offline. Uh, a couple other areas in our lab that we're excited about. Uh, some work uh, applying physical chemistry to the inactivation of viruses. So at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of people were asking this question of how does temperature impact the inactivation of viruses across different climates, or maybe even, for example, trying to decontaminate things like masks in your home oven. And so we've gotten some NSF funding to try to answer that question and have had some nice success so far. Uh, and then the last thing that I wanted to point out here is thinking about things like advanced filtration. So we're additively manufacturing filters. Here I'm showing one where we have a corkscrew or helical shaped pathway that in this case uses centrifugal force to whip maybe droplets or particulate to the outer wall where it can be captured in this filter. So those are some of the areas um, that we're looking at in the lab right now that I'm not gonna talk about in detail. But one of the areas that I do wanna talk about in a little bit more detail today is this, right? And so this is a spider. It's a dead spider, but it's clearly moving, and I'm gonna discuss what's going on here uh, in the next few slides. We've come up with this approach that we're calling necrobotics. Um, so we're using a biotic material, a material that was once alive, but is now dead. That's our source material for this robotic gripper. Uh, and essentially the process is that we have the deceased spider as the source material. We tap into an internal hydraulic system with a hypodermic needle, and then we can apply pressure to open and close the legs. So, this comes from maybe starting to think about bioinspiration. Here's an example that folks in the audience are certainly familiar with is the lotus leaf. And if we zoom in on the lotus leaf, we can see these micro and nano textures as well as knowing that it has some waxy chemistry uh, to promote super hydrophobicity. And we can be inspired by this and we can reproduce it right in the lab. We can make things that work even better than the lotus leaf. This is true not just for interfacial phenomena, but also for robotics. So folks at MIT have developed this cheetah that can run around and go through these leaves and do a backflip, right? Um, and over at Harvard, they've been working on this robo bee inspired by nature as well, um, very small scale, and they've recently demonstrated even untethered flight. Um, on the other hand, in robotics, people have been thinking about, instead of using bio-inspiration, 
why don't we just use biology itself? So biohybridization, we can take living tissue and incorporate it as part of our robot. And then we can maybe electronically stimulate some of this tissue for actuation, like in these couple of videos shown here. Um, and then we can even use, for example, maybe a living plant. So we have something like a Venus flytrap, which we can electronically stimulate to grab an object and lift it up. The problem with some of these approaches is they work quite well, but they require careful maintenance. They need nutrients. They need a nice environment to stay alive. And so there are definitely some drawbacks in terms of this biohybridization. So our approach kind of lies at the middle of bioinspiration and biohybridization, where we use these biotic materials. They were once alive, but they're not anymore. And some examples might include maybe bones, like our early ancestors used for tools. But today, maybe even leather products, like my belt here, or wood, right? These are things that are examples of biotic materials. Why did we pick spiders? Well, they turn out to be actually a pretty great source material for gripping applications. And the reason is, as humans, we have antagonistic muscle pairs. So we think about extending our arms with our triceps, contracting our arms towards the body with our biceps. Spiders and arachnids generally don't have extensors. And instead, they use pressure to move their appendages away from the body. And this is actually the reason why, if you've ever seen a dead spider around your house, they're all curled up, right? Because they're no longer generating this pressure, so they can't extend their legs away from the body anymore. So we start with this deceased spider as our source material, as I said. Um, in our case, we acquired spiders from a biological supply company and euthanized them following a procedure that was detailed in the literature with cold temperature. And then we tap into their internal hydraulic system through the prosoma, the main section of the body, with a hypodermic needle. And then we apply a drop of superglue to get a hermetic seal. And the application of this drop of superglue actually we found pretty interesting. We call it a three-step energy minimization. Uh, we first have a minimization of surface energy as the drop transfers from the applicator to the needle. Then we minimize potential energy as it slides down, if it's big enough. And then when it hits the surface, we minimize surface energy once again uh, with this meniscus. And so this basically happens automatically. Uh, and we zoomed in here with SEM to verify that we got a nice seal. We went on to characterize the force that one of these necrobotic grippers can apply to an object. And in this case, the object won't move. We'll slip off the object. And that's intentional, because we want to characterize the maximum force that we can apply before slipping. We'll see that that force peaks as we lift up the gripper and then declines. And as we slip off, drops back to zero. And so that's captured in this plot. This result is without any pressure applied to the gripper. But we can actually also apply intermediate levels of pressure to get different maximum forces. And so that's going to be shown here, where as we increase the pressure that's applied, we then lower the gripping force. Uh, it kind of makes sense, because if we apply enough pressure, it'll be fully open, right? And so we can see a nice monotonic relationship here uh, between our gripping force and our applied pressure, which shows a good level of controllability as maybe a robotic actuator. We have a bunch of applications that we've also showcased. I just want to show one video here in the interest of time. And this is a tetherless use of the necrobotic gripper, where the user is applying pressure with his handheld syringe for a pick and place task. Might inspire potential use in the field for handling delicate objects like insects in field work, uh, where this pneumatic gripping approach gives quite a gentle touch. We don't maybe have to worry about harming our specimens. And then a few other highlights that I just wanted to point out about the work. You know, we looked a lot at the performance, the repeatability over time uh, starts to degrade after maybe 700 cycles or so. We picked up objects of different sizes. We looked at the chemical degradation over time. One thing that was pretty interesting was that a scaling analysis for this type of gripping mechanism revealed that we'll actually have better performance with smaller spiders as the source material. We'll be able to get a higher gripping force to weight ratio. And then we looked at different object sizes. And finally, at things like dehydration, where if we let this sit out for a long time, it does eventually start to become brittle due to dehydration. So thinking about ways to mitigate that. We have a few future directions that we're pursuing now. The one that I'm most excited about is the one that's highlighted here, sort of the fundamental studies of arachnid locomotion. And what we have in mind there is individually addressing each one of the legs such that we can start to get this system to walk in the lab and use it to figure out maybe how arachnids walk and how we can do even better. So this was a pretty fun project to work on. Uh, we're excited to see what happens next, both from us and maybe from other folks. Um, 
We got the back cover of this journal, which was nice. And we also got some media coverage. And I'm going to let this one play real quick. This is from The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Um, we watched this in our group meeting, and we were all cracking up. And um, in addition to this, actually, just a couple weeks ago, so some of you may have um, heard about the Ig Nobel Prize already. Uh, it's awarded each year to projects or research um, programs that maybe make people laugh, but then think. And we were pretty excited to find out just a couple weeks ago that we were awarded this Ig Nobel Prize uh, this year. So we'll be, um, we did everything sort of online already, but we'll be flying up to Boston for an in-person event in November. And so we're all very excited about this. Um, turned out that there was some coverage here in India uh, about this. Team, including the Indian researcher, wins. <laughs> and I think some of you in the audience may be quite familiar with this Indian researcher. It's Dr. Anup Rajapan, who did his bachelor's degree here at IIT Madras and worked uh, with Professor Sen uh, as an undergraduate researcher. And in fact, I believe got a few papers out at that time. And so I wanted to talk about this necrobotics, but now I'm going to shift gears. Uh, and highlight actually some other work that Anoop has been involved in in my lab as a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, and I have here a perspective that he's led uh, where we're thinking about this transition in robotics from traditional hard materials, metals and plastics and circuit boards to soft counterparts. So why would we want to do that? Well, maybe we think about robots that are compliant, that can squeeze through tight spaces. Maybe we think about robots with this soft fluidic approach that don't rely on electronics and maybe can move into high radiation environments or avoid electromagnetic uh, pulse consequences. And so there's a lot of motivation here and there's a lot of other groups. We're not the only group thinking about this. Uh, and in fact, what we found was that there are so many groups now working on soft robotics that the field is becoming uh, really saturated with literature. And so we've conducted a review, a data-driven review of nearly 5,000 papers in the literature about soft robotics. And what we found, maybe I'll highlight just a few of the key conclusions here. First, looking at this Sankey diagram, if we focus on the right-hand side, most actuators, or at least the plurality of actuators, are fluidic in nature, meaning that we have soft materials, we apply some pressure to get some motion or actuation. But we look at other typical robotic components, sensors, controllers, and sources of power, and the vast majority of all of these are still electronic in nature, right? So there's a little bit of a mismatch in the functional medium here. And then if we look uh, now at the type of materials that are being used and focus specifically on controllers, what we see in this dark blue box down here is that the vast majority of controllers are also still rigid in nature. So think about rigid electronic controllers, uh, things like these circuit boards and other elements that really kind of defeat the purpose in a lot of applications of moving towards these fully soft robots. And so this was an area that we've already been trying to address, highlighting here some work that I've been involved with in the past. Uh, in the top left, developing something that acts a lot like a CMOS transistor. And then in the top right, we have combined a few of those together to get a sequential actuation. So in this top right video, we have just one constant input pressure, but we get this coordinated locomotion. Uh, we can incorporate sensing like in the bottom left and in the bottom right. I quite like this video. We are starting to move towards thinking about maybe building intelligence directly into the structure of some of these robots. And in the bottom right, we just have a canister of compressed air, a handful of drinking straws, some rubber bands, and a rubber gripper. Uh, no electronics on board, and we can travel forward, grab, and then retrieve an object and come back. So this is some pretty cool behavior that we're excited about and starting to pursue more going forward. But there's an application space that we saw a lot of potential in that had not been tapped into yet uh, in terms of some of this fluidic soft control. And that's textile-based wearables. So why would we be interested in that? We see a lot of potential there for assistive devices, garments that you can put on that apply forces to the body to help with your activities of daily living. And this is something that we're predicting maybe over 2 billion people may need by 2030, but really a very small fraction of those people are projected to have access to the assistive devices that will help them with these activities of daily living. In the video, we see some uh, pneumatic artificial muscles on the legs that help the user walk. But one of the reasons that these devices aren't being adopted is if we look at the user's back, they have this heavy backpack on, and that's the control and power source uh, for this assistive device, preventing adoption for a lot of people. And so we said, you know, why don't we instead take this control and build it directly into the textile architecture itself, such that it's lightweight, compliant, comfortable, um, easy to wear. And maybe that'll help boost the adoption. 
And so that brings us finally back to the title that I've pitched at the beginning of the talk, which is this embedded fluidic control in the compliant 2D architecture, like for example, your clothing. We think about how we might want to build that. Uh, we're looking here at some AND and OR gates for digital logic. Uh, we see, first of all, that we're probably going to need maybe a transistor-like component, right? And so we thought, how can we build that in the fluidic domain? There's already been a lot of work, for example, with these pinch-type valves. We've heard even these brought up in a few talks um, earlier here at the conference. These are also known, of course, as the quake valve, where in this case we see some pressure applied to the transparent channel that prevents flow in the blue flow channel. This uh, works pretty well, but we do typically need a higher pressure in the gating transparent channel than the pressure in the flow channel, and so that prevents things like cascadability. Uh, in contrast, we have a new approach that's called a kink valve, just like kinking your garden hose to prevent flow. And with this approach, we can also prevent the flow, but we can do it with a much lower control pressure, lower than the pressure inside the flow channel itself. And so we opted to go for a kink type valve uh, in this textile based architecture. And the way that we built it is shown here. So we have in yellow this U shaped flow channel. And then in green, if we look at a cross section, we have a couple of offset pouches that inflate. That's what's happening in the video here is that we're inflating those offset pouches. And when we do that, we form kinks in this internal flow channel. And we can understand that through some basically simple geometric modeling of what the system should look like as we pressurize those offset pouches by some percentage S. And we form kinks at these regions C and B. And to understand this, we had to generate this set of equations and solve them numerically. And what we came up with was the model curve here in red that matches quite well with our experimental data points in black. Uh, we see that we have a pretty good ability to predict as a function of this overlap fraction of these inflating pouches what that kink angle is. One thing to note though is that this only works uh, up to some certain overlap fraction. And if we get to really high overlap fractions, we actually see this geometry, like in the bottom right picture here, where instead of forming these nice sharp kinks, we get this S-shaped buckle. S-shaped buckle here still allows flow, so it's not an effective valve. Uh, and the reason that this happens is because we're now again working with these uh, 2D elements, right? Things like sheets of textile, these can support tension really quite well, but when you put them under compression, like this, they'll simply buckle. And so we stayed away from this regime over here. In fact, we chose an overlap fraction of 50%, which was suitable uh, for all of our applications, and that gives a kink angle of about 49 degrees. So from here, we went out uh, to fabricate this textile inverter. And I wanted to just briefly show the fabrication process for folks that are not familiar with it. It's a bunch of layers that are stuck together with heat and pressure. Uh, we start with some textile and we apply a mask and then we laser pattern the mask and that looks like this. We can see where we're going to define that flow channel and also those offset pouches. From here we pull off the mask where we do want adhesion to occur. And then we're going to take this and um, if we look at the material itself, we have a thermoplastic coating that causes the adhesion. And then we'll take these and we'll stack and bond them. And so we can envision, if I've color coded them for clarity here, folding the two layers together that are going to define this flow channel, and then placing them in between the outer layers that are going to define those offset pouches, and take the whole thing and basically close it like a book and apply heat and pressure and it will bond together and give us the device that we want. Again, that looks like this. And so we form these nice kinks at those locations, C and B, that prevent flow from occurring. And so we now have the kink valve, acts like a relay. And we built that into an inverter. We're moving towards an inverter as a basic building block for digital logic. But another component that I have not talked about yet, but that is shown in the bottom right here, is a fluidic resistor. This is a critical component for these uh, inverters as well as other logic elements. Um, and the reason for that is, well, first of all, you kind of might have guessed from looking at these circuits, right? We see the resistors on here, so we thought maybe we're going to need those. But I'd like to illustrate just graphically why those are so critical. So we might apply pressure, we get some actuation. Uh, this is the desired behavior with the kink valve open. But then we apply some pressure to the kink valve, form the kink. You'd imagine here that you want your actuator to deflate. But nothing happens, right? There's nowhere for the pressurized fluid to go. And so by adding this pull down resistor, we do lose a little bit of fluid, pressurized fluid in the on state shown at the top. Uh, you can design a system such that this is some small fraction of pressure drop. 
And then the bottom state, what this allows us to do is deflate the actuator. And so there's, of course, some trade-off between the deflation speed and the loss of pressure in the top state. Oop. Oh. I've accelerated pretty fast there. So how do we make one of these fluidic resistors? I looked at the logo here for the uh, conference and thought maybe there's one. <laughs> People use these, of course, for a lot of different things like mixing, but they also have a pretty high fluidic resistance. And that's where we started. We built some of these serpentine channels between textile sheets. And they worked, but we found that they were a bit difficult in our platform to fabricate. And more importantly, actually, they were a bit difficult to model or predict the fluidic resistance. And this is because if you think about the traditional microfluidics, right, you might define some 3D channel uh, with some known dimensions. You can use something like a hagen poise equation to figure out what the fluidic resistance should be. In this case, we have some relationship between the internal pressure and the actual shape of the channel itself, such that we have the pressure dropping as we flow through here, but that's also influencing what the shape is, and the shape is giving you that dpdx relationship, so there's sort of a coupled problem that becomes a little bit difficult to solve. And so instead, we said, maybe we'll use a different approach. We actually went with just some open cell, flexible polyurethane foam. You can just squish it up in your hand, and they sell big sheets of this open cell foam. If we zoom in, it looks like this. There are some quite small pores. Uh, and as we flow through those, they offer a great fluidic resistance. We can model these with sort of a flow through a porous medium, like a Darcy's Law type flow. Uh, we did that, and we chose, in our case, to use annular resistors for the reproducibility. We can flow from the inside to the outside, or from the outside to the inside. And if we solve for the fluidic resistance, we get something that looks like this, where we have some geometry here. And also, a couple of terms that we can combine to get what we would call a sheet resistance, right? Just like in electrical systems. And if you're familiar with sheet resistance in electrical systems, it's something that you can measure with what we call a four-point probe test. We apply some current through the outer probes, measure some voltage across the inner probes. Here's what the instrument looks like if you haven't used it before. We can zoom in here and we can see those four probes as they touch your sample. And we would use some equation that looks like this, where we have the applied voltage uh, or the applied current and the measured voltage, as well as some factor that accounts for the geometry here. And so here's a big sheet of uh, open cell foam, the flexible foam. We've built the same system to measure the sheet resistance here, and we use some pressure gauges as well as a flow meter to do this experiment. Uh, we know that the equation for the four-point probe looks like this. Our equation looks like this. So we actually had to make a couple of modifications here. One of them that I'll point out is that we're using sort of an uh, adjusted or effective flow rate that accounts for the compressibility of the flow. So we worked through the math to get here. And another uh, modification is that this prefactor beta over here on the left was about four and a half. Um, that was okay for the electronic systems where at the edge, there's no current leaving or coming in. In our system, we have open edges. Uh, over here, we can have flow coming in or out. And so we ran some numerical simulation to figure out that in this case, instead of four and a half, we have some factor beta here that corrects for the geometry of about seven. So from there, we can do the measurements. We have these four point fluidic measurements to get the sheet resistance of the open cell foam. They fall really nicely on this line, right? And what does the line indicate? The slope of the line gives us the sheet resistance, which we show here at the top of the slide. And this is tunable, so we don't have to stick to just one thickness of this sheet. Uh, we can go to different sheet thicknesses and we would find that if we have a log-log plot of our sheet resistance, that includes maybe on our x-axis the log of the thickness of the sheet, we would expect some negative one slope over here. And that's exactly what we get. So if we fit a line to this and measure the slope for different sheet thicknesses, we get a slope of just about negative one. Uh, this is for two different thicknesses of monolithic sheets, and then we also did a scenario where we combined two sheets together, bonded them to each other, to basically have stacked sheets on top of each other as we want to get a little bit thicker and lower the resistance. We fabricated the fluidic resistors from here, and so we basically just punched them out with a hole punch, uh, used the experimental setup here to look at the flow rate versus the pressure drop, and we have the data points here for a range of outer radii, inner diameters, uh, and also two different sheet thicknesses for this open cell foam. And we can use the equation that we've set up before. Uh, in this case, again, we do take into account the compressibility in this flow of air. Uh, but we have the resistance shown here. And we find a really good match between our uh, model predictions and the experimental results that we're getting for these foam resistors. 
And so with these resistors in hand, we have a nice tool to design the fluidic resistance in these systems. We said, what could we use these for? Before we even get back to the digital logic, maybe we could just use the resistors by themselves. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work in my group on haptics applications for virtual and augmented realities and wearables. Uh, so you might think about using wearables like the armband shown here or the sleeve shown here to apply forces to the body uh, that maybe help you feel things in the uh, virtual or augmented realities or maybe even navigate in the real, real world here. Uh, and you can do things like change the force, you can turn them on and off to get vibration or flutter, and you can add multiple cells that inflate to get spatial control. Where this gets interesting is when you want to think about spatiotemporal control. So you might have, for example, the sleeve that's depicted here, and you might want to generate some haptic cue that imparts a feeling of motion along the arm, right? So we want to go one, two, three. And so we can do that, as shown on the left here, we have valve-based programming. We have one, two, three solenoid valves. We have one, two, three tethers to the different um, inflatable regions. That's fine, but it's a little bit cumbersome in terms of the infrastructure. And so with fluidic programming, we can just use the capacitance of the inflatable regions on the sleeve itself, as well as the resistance, which we now know how to design, uh, to basically generate a similar moving cue along the arm with just one valve and one input. So the system looks something like this. Uh, we basically show here the one, two, three inflatable regions, as well as some of these fluidic resistors that we've talked about how to design. And I have a video here that captures that behavior. So we'll input pressure on the left, and then those other three ports are just to measure the pressure. There's no flow occurring. And we get a nice RC-like response here that we can use in one of these haptic sleeves for really, a really natural feeling for navigation. And then we said, you know, why don't we demonstrate this in a few applications? So we showed a user using a scooter here. Uh, we did send some wireless signals uh, that were converted to input pressures for the wearable. Uh, through a small electronic device here, but the infrastructure, again, uh, the requirements were reduced significantly by putting a lot of the control into the textile sheets themselves. And we had the user navigate around Houston. And then for fun, we also had some wireless control of a user walking around a field and had her walk around and draw a Tetris piece. Uh, and in fact, we made her draw all the Tetris pieces. And that was some inspiration for this cover um, of this journal device. This issue just came out, uh, again, about a couple weeks ago. So this is something we did with just resistors and the capacitances of the system. But now I want to circle back and sort of close the loop with the full digital logic. And so this will be the last part of the talk where we combine the fluidic resistor, we combine that with the kink valve that we've already discussed in this 2D architecture, and we look at digital logic. So I'll just jump right into some experimental results for the inverter. What we see here is all the pressures are normalized to 50 kilopascal, and when we have a high input pressure, we get a low output pressure, and vice versa. So the behavior is what we want. Uh, you can see that visually in this video. So if we look at the input, it's low here, and the output is high. And then as the input goes to a high value, the output goes low. So it's validated with experiments. We said, why don't we combine inverters into some digital logic circuits? So we started simple. We combined two inverters in parallel. We stuck these inverters onto a hook and loop or Velcro breadboard and hooked them together with rubber tubes. Um, and then we have some supply pressure, again, 50 kilopascals coming in. And we have inputs, X and Y, and output, Z. So schematically, it looks like this. Those are the two inverters. Experimentally, it looks like this. The output pressure, Z, is always at a high state unless both X and Y are at a high pressure, at which point Z goes to a low pressure. That's going to be shown over here on the bottom right in what's called a truth table to capture that behavior. And this is what's called a NAND gate. So this is one example of how we can combine these to get more complex logic operators. Uh, we can combine them also in series. And in series, they look like this. The experiments look like this. And the truth table looks like this. This would be called a NOR gate. And so I want to stop here for one moment and just emphasize the importance of having either NAND or NOR gates. They give us a system that's called functionally complete. This means that we can build any Boolean logic circuit now. Uh, and maybe one way to illustrate that is to look at the Apollo guidance computer from the Apollo 11 mission that first put man on the moon. This was built from just over 5,000 NOR gates. That's all that's here. And so we can zoom in and look at them, and we can see Buzz Aldrin. And in the background, and in this box, we can see this Apollo guidance computer. So that's sort of the power of just either NAND or NOR gates by themselves combined. One step further from that is to look at combining these for a bit of memory. 
So we have here what's called an SR, or set reset latch. With the set reset latch, the inputs over here on the right either set or reset the bit of memory, and the outputs are Q for our bit of memory, and Q prime is just always the opposite of that. Uh, we cross-connect the inverters as shown here, and that gives us basically the feedback to enable this bit of memory. And the operation is gonna be shown in these plots. So if the input pressure is high, the output pressure Q also goes to a high value. And it's gonna remain there no matter what we do to that input set um, until we finally apply a high pressure to the reset input. And when we apply a high pressure to the reset input, we have that output Q drop to a low value. And it'll stay there until we then again apply a high pressure to the set input. And we can capture that as well in a truth table. So this was a pretty exciting step. We now have not just uh, decision making, but also memory. And then we said maybe another step to take would be to move towards integrated circuits. So I've been showing these all stuck onto Velcro breadboards. Can we make a monolithic textile sheet that has all of these things built in? And the answer here was yes. So we built the SR, or set reset latch into here, and we also incorporated two push buttons because we wanted to receive input from a human user. How do these push buttons work? In brief, if you're not pushing on it, we can pass pressurized air through, and um, we get a high output. And if you do push on it, you pinch the channel, just like the quake valve in this case, and the output goes to a low value by way of this pull-down resistor. And the behavior here shows that if the force applied by the human user's finger, which was measured by a force-sensitive resistor behind the device, goes high on the set side, we get a high output pressure, and it'll stay there until this user pushes with their finger the reset button, where we'll drop down this output pressure. So now we just wanted to show an application. Uh, we did that here with the hood for thermal regulation. We do have one other element here. This acts as a buffer to isolate our control system from the high capacitance or high volume of this system that lifts the hood onto the user's head. And then from here we show a video uh, where we're gonna have a heater and thermocouple to simulate body heat and measure the temperature. And we're going to apply a light breeze to the user's head. And it turns out, in fact, that a light breeze is a technical term it's defined by the US National Weather Service. So we applied that using a fan. And so in the video, which I'll scrub through here, uh, just in the interest of time, we have the user press the set button, and the hood comes up. And we see, of course, the temperature at the top of the head increase as expected. Maybe you got too hot. You come back over here, and you touch the reset button, and the hood comes down. And it'll stay down, and you'll cool off again. So that's pretty much the entire uh, intended behavior that we expected. And this, for example, could be really important for folks that might have limited overhead mobility and instead just want to touch a region on their garment. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about, the last slide right here, is the durability. And so this is a big advantage when you think about assistive devices, assistive wearables and clothing, because we have a lot of wearable electronic work that's being done. But so far, we have yet to see really durable wearable electronics. A lot of these, as they continue to flex, the electrical connections will break. As you put them through the washing machine, they won't work. And so in this case, we put an inverter through 20,000 on-off cycles, put it through a million cycles of flexion, and we also ran it through the washing machine 20 times and even ran it over five times with a truck, which was 10 wheel passes. Uh, and from here, we found that the inverter still retained the same exact operation as we had had initially. So we're really excited about this area of research. We've demonstrated some logic and control in a 2D architecture, which we think is amenable to wearables, textile sheets. Uh, we show that here with this thermoregulation application, but we're working also on force-based assistance. Didn't talk about it today, but we've also been working a lot on fully pneumatic, non-electronic energy harvesting approaches. Here are the users generating energy as she walks from foot strike on the ground, and she can use that to power actuators like this third arm at her hip. And ultimately, what we're gonna do moving forward is envision these fully self-powered assistive wearables that don't have any electronics on board that you could just throw in your washing machine at home. So that's what we're moving towards with the help of uh, the career award that we recently got. And from here, I'm gonna just put up some of the references for the work I talked about for Fluidic Logic, thank the team one more time, and then I think open up for questions. Thank you, Danny, for a wonderful Thank you, Dan, for a wonderful talk. And now we can have a few questions. Thank you for the talk. Uh, well, I have a question regarding your biohybrid manipulators. Okay. Well, uh, the thing is, uh, I would like to know the durability and effectiveness of that vibrator, I mean the manipulator. So the thing is, there are already, already manipulators available in the market which can handle fruit. So we have flexible fingers powered by pneumatics. Yes. So how is that different from your work? 
That is the so first. the question I think is that there are already existing designs that can do similar capability. Yeah. Why would we want this approach? <clears throat> I think there could be some advantages, first of all, in reducing some waste streams. So if you have an application where sometimes the gripper has to be disposed of, this is biodegradable. We don't have to worry about introducing more waste streams from traditional robotic components. Um, in addition to that, we can potentially move to very small scales using a small spider as the source material where the fabrication of maybe some small scale or even micro scale grippers can be challenging. So that's something we're looking into now as well. Um, and then maybe in the longer term, we can think about potentially even having these spiders grown in clean environments such that this could be used potentially during a surgery. So that's something that's a little bit more out there. But you know, if you leave it in the body, does it matter? Maybe not. So. Okay. Another question is regarding the effectiveness and uh, durability of that particular gripper. So you're using the natural material for gripping, right? Yes. So the durability and effectiveness of that gripper, did you measure in multiple cycles? Yes, so we ran it for 1,000 cycles. Mm -hmm. We saw degradation after about 700 cycles in the performance. Uh, we also know that over a period of about two weeks, it starts to dehydrate and yeah, become exactly. brittle. Yeah. We did solve that problem by applying a thin polymer coating. So that's one way to overcome the dehydration. But I think that there are still some limitations, like you mentioned, that would have to be addressed. So certainly we would say a new area or approach to this uh, problem that we think there are still some open questions. Yeah, I mean, my view is that these naturally occurring materials, uh, they work effectively as long as the organism is alive. Once the organism is dead, you know, the functional properties degrade over time. So that is what we need to consider. I guess I would push back and say that certainly there are cases like my belt where the animal is dead, but it still serves the purpose. <laughs> So there's some room, I think, to look for some utility here, uh, even though in this case, it might not be the ideal solution for every application. Yeah. Hi, Christian. It's really nice talk. So my question is the second part, actually. I mean, where you made that uh, textile uh, kind of this uh, energy harvesters and et cetera. So the main part, the, especially the durability of the joints aspects, actually, how you pasted them, actually, how much pressure it can sustain the in terms of the joints when you... Oh, when before it bursts, yeah, for yeah. example? Yes, yes. Uh, this is a good question. This is a question that we're addressing in some ongoing work. Uh, so my brief answer is that it depends on the length scale. Okay. Uh, you would imagine that there's some sort of a force that the pressure might apply that varies with some area, and there's some adhesive force that maybe varies with just the length scale itself. Um, so smaller things can withstand higher pressures. Um, that's my answer in a nutshell. And then we'll hopefully follow up with something more quantitative. Okay, I'll look into that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, for the logic system. Uh, it's quite slow compared to the electronic system. In second, you know, I see all the cycle that you are showing. Yes. In second, you know, that don't, don't you think it is too slow? Do I think it's too slow? So I will start with the fundamental limit. It will always be slower. So we have some speed of light. Maybe you could imagine for some electronic system. Maybe speed of sound here, right? or something along those lines. And so we'll always be slower. We cannot do better. In this case, there is still room to make it better. We can optimize. Um, I don't think that this fluidic logic is the solution to every wearable application. But I do think that it works really well for like a low level control. Things like maybe uh, simple thermoregulation that doesn't matter how long it takes. If it's one second or 10 seconds to put on your hood, maybe you'll still get warm fast enough. I think if you have to have a really quick response, like something for gait, for example, you're walking, right? This may not be the right solution. We might need a faster dynamic control. OK. Thank you, Dan, again. And as there are no other questions, thank you. So there is a small gift from our side.